I propose that all elections for board members of nonprofit corporations should be run by the state at taxpayer expense. After all, we already have taxpayer-funded elections for private organizations. We call them primaries. While this year's presidential primaries are pretty much a fait accompli, there are still hundreds, if not thousands, of primary elections that will be held over the next few months. In some cases, the race is so partisan that the primary effectively decides the race and the general election is moot. What's the purpose of these taxpayer-funded private elections? Why, to limit your choice on Election Day, of course. So why do we keep paying for someone else to take away our choices? Well, that's what we're going to discuss next on the Constitution Study. Love the neighbors and have a few good friends. Every day you were everyday Americans. Oh, every day you were everyday Americans. Hello there, everyday Americans. Paul Engel here with the Constitution Study, where we read and study the Constitution. Teach your rising generation to be free. And I'm glad you could join me today. We're in the middle of the election season, so let's start off talking about primaries. I'm going to have a lot of discussions in the next few months about elections and what the Constitution says, especially about the presidential election. So we're going to start today with the primaries. You can find out more, search for other articles and content on this topic at the website constitutionstudy.com. I'll talk a bit more about that at the end of the program, but for now, let's talk about these primaries. It may surprise many of you, but the word primary did not exist in the Constitution until 1964 with the ratification of the 24th Amendment, which reads, The rights of citizens of the United States to vote in any primary or other election for president or vice president, for electors for president or vice president, or for senators or representatives in Congress shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state by reason of failure to pay any poll tax or other tax. Though there were a few primaries in the United States as early as the 1840s, it wasn't until the early 20th century that they became widespread. In fact, the modern primary is merely the latest attempt by political parties to control elections. Starting in the colonial period and continuing into the 19th century, political parties widely used caucuses to choose their candidates for state and local offices. Although the use of caucuses declined in the 20th century, Several states still used them to choose their state's political party's candidate for president. Now, concerns about abuses of the caucus system led state political parties to adopt conventions as the method of choosing their candidates. However, abuses in this system has led to their general demise, with the exception of the national party's choices for their presidential candidates. For the most part, conventions have been replaced by primary elections in the 20th century. The process of political parties choosing their candidates became more and more influential as we changed how we voted. For the first 50 years of our history, people did not vote by secret ballot. Rather, people voted viva voce, or by voice. This helps explain why Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution requires presidential electors to vote by ballot. The electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for two persons of whom one at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. Imagine walking into a courthouse swearing on a Bible that you were who you claimed to be and had not already voted, then announcing in front of the entire room your name and who you were voting for. That's how it was done until the early 19th century. While this may sound crazy to modern ears, the party atmosphere that surrounded voting probably explained why turnouts routinely reach as high as 85%. In the early 19th century, states started adopting the paper ballot, but not like the ones we see today. The original paper ballot was nothing but a blank scrap of paper, which you would write in your candidate's name and drop it in a box. In an attempt to be helpful, newspapers began printing blank ballots, listing only the offices which were up for election. Voters could clip these ballots out of the paper, write in their candidate's name, and drop them in the ballot box. How long do you think it was before political parties figured out a way to influence the vote. If your answer is not long, you'd be correct. By the mid-19th century, state Democrat and Republican parties were printing flyers with not only the offices, but the party's candidate already filled in. And it was legal for people to simply drop these pre-printed tickets in the ballot box, which certainly made voting down the party line easier. 
This, of course, led to claims of fraud, which led to states like New York and Massachusetts in 1888 to require voters to use only ballots printed by the state. These ballots resemble what we see today, listing not only the offices, but all the candidates who are running for those offices. By using state laws to hamper a candidate's ability to be on said ballot, the political parties have been able to regulate who you get to vote for in the actual elections. Now, states do allow write-in voting, but the laws often make it extremely difficult to win a race that way. For example, most states have a requirement that the candidate's name be legible, written a certain way, and that it be spelled properly. Joe Biden ran a write-in campaign for the Democratic primary in New Hampshire. I wonder if the rules required the people to write in Joe Biden, Joseph Biden, Joseph R. Biden, or Joseph Robinette Biden. Not only does a write-in candidate have to convince people to vote for them, they also have to train them to spell their name correctly. This is probably why, since the general adoption of state printed ballots, only two congressional races have been won by writing candidates, Strom Thurmond in 1954 and Charlie Wilson in 2006. Now, the states are not only in control of who is on the ballot, but allow the state political parties to make that decision for them. This creates a very incestuous relationship where those in office making the laws make sure the political parties have an advantage, which leaves us with a situation where the political parties tell us which of their members the people will be allowed to vote for. Of course, we're told that it's the people in the parties who are choosing their candidates, but the last two presidential elections exposed that to be a lie. In both 2016 and 2020, Bernie Sanders was leading the race for the Democratic nomination for president, only to have his chance taken away by party machinations. Well, that might be the most blatant example, it certainly isn't the only time political parties have influenced the nomination process. Through money, power, and influence, the American people are told who would be the most electable candidate, or who would best represent the party, all to get us to choose the candidate the party wants. The higher the office, more time, money, and influence the parties expend to tell you how to vote. By the time we get to election day, most of the decisions have already been made because most people vote for their party's candidate. And as a last insult to injury, the states have their own taxpayers paying to help take away your choice. We've even created a phrase I hear almost every election. We're told we have to choose the lesser of two evils. Of course, it's never mentioned that the two evils were chosen by the political parties. Now, since these primaries are run by the state, the taxpayer gets to pay the bill. Not just the printing of the ballot, but ensuring they are distributed to each and every county. Then, of course, the county has to pay to make sure the ballots are available at each polling station. Then there's the manpower needed to run those polling stations. The cost that is ever increasing as election day has been expanded into election week and even election month. Then there are the ballot collection, counting, and reporting. And let's not forget what happens if there's a runoff or a problem. All paid for by good old we the people, run by the state, and controlled by the political parties. All so that on the actual election day, you are psychologically directed to choose only from those candidates the political parties have approved. What most people don't seem to realize is that your state's political parties are nonprofit corporations which means that primaries are actually elections for private organizations, the political parties. So not only are you the taxpayer paying for elections for private organizations, your own state laws are used to allow those private organizations to limit who you see on the ballot. How corrupt does that sound to you? I've seen several people make suggestions to solve this problem, and a few states have tried. Some states have an open primary where an individual can vote in a primary without being affiliated with that party. Some states have started using ranked choice voting where people choose up to three candidates followed by a rather complicated process that is used to weed the selection down to one. Others use a jungle primary, also known as a Cajun primary or a Louisiana majority vote system where all candidates are on the ballot. If an individual gets a majority of the vote for an office, they win. If not, then there's a runoff election between the top two vote getters. This has the advantage of getting rid of the primary, but often requires a later runoff vote. Personally, I like the idea of just having 
all of the candidates eligible and running for an office on the ballot, like we see in both ranked choice voting and jungle primaries. Of the two, I much prefer the latter. Although it does frequently delay the decision, it doesn't have the complicated whittle-down process of ranked choice voting, and I think the costs in both time and money for a Louisiana majority vote are offset by the improved ability to accurately represent the will of the voters. Now, maybe there's another idea out there, an even better system. If there is, not aware of it, but would be interested if you think so. So if you have what you think is a better idea, please let me know. It seems this idea of the political primary or its variants have become so much a part of our election process, most people don't even realize it's a relatively new thing. While I have no problem with political parties choosing their preferred candidates, I'm opposed to them doing all they can to limit my choices to those candidates. Imagine walking into a voting booth and the ballot listing all the names of the people who have qualified to run for office. There still needs to be some vetting process for candidates, some paperwork to request access to the ballot, and probably some process to ensure there's enough support to warrant being included. Beyond that, let all comers be on the ballot and let the people decide. I know what I'm saying sounds radical, but really, it's just a return to how things used to be. I'm not saying we should go back to voice voting, but shouldn't we the people be the deciders of who we can vote for rather than the political parties? Don't we denigrate countries like Iran and Venezuela, where political actors limit the choices on the ballot? I'm not naive enough to think such a change could happen in the current spirit of revenge between our two largest political parties. For everyone who wished for a chance to vote for a third-party candidate, though, shouldn't we be working to make it more possible, rather than following these fighting tribes further down the road to the ruin of our public liberty? I was well into my 50s before I realized what primaries really were. So ingrained are they into our political processes. It wasn't until I tried to explain them to somebody that I really realized, wait a second, what are we doing here? I remember going to a, a county meeting uh, in a neighboring county, and it was, a, it was a, a, a political party meeting, and they were proud that for the first time they were going to have a primary. I was silent because it wasn't my place to speak, but I was also saddened to see that they were going to further limit the choice of their people. We're not getting rid of primaries, especially not in the near future. But I wanted you to be aware of what they really were. As we talk about these primary systems, remember, it is you, the taxpayer, that's paying for a private organization to determine who they want on the ballot in such a way that you won't get a choice of somebody else, to make it harder to choose somebody else. Only the people the political parties want are put on the ballot, whether that's what the people want or not. There's a lot of discussion and a lot of debate, but hopefully with a little bit of knowledge and maybe a little bit of action, you can consider more wisely how you want to go into the future. Now, as I said, this is going to be the first of a number of episodes on elections and how they work, especially around the presidential election. I picked that primarily because I deal with the federal constitution, not all the states. So there are really only three offices that are elected for federal office, so the Senate, the House, and electors for president. We'll get into that as the year goes on. But I hope this opened your eyes. I hope you'll head to the website, constitutionstudy.com. Maybe find out more about elections and how they work. Maybe ask a question about what specifically about election you'd like to learn some more of. Be more than happy to answer it. Maybe you'll sign up for a mailing list and, and get updates from me. And maybe you can consider our Patriots program. It's been growing slowly, so I'm glad to see that. And I still have a lot of work to do. I'd love to get your feedback on what you'd like to see in the Patriots. Most of all, I hope you come back and join us here next time for the Constitution Study. Love your neighbors and have a few good friends every day you work.